Good evening, and thank you for watching. My name is Hank Stevenson, and I'll be the moderator for this evening's debate. The Citizens Clean Elections Commission is the sponsor for this event. As the state's voter education agency, Clean Elections hosts debates so voters have the opportunity to hear directly from candidates, ask questions on the issues that matter most to them, and vote informed. Candidates that have a contested primary election have been invited to participate in the debate. Candidates that have opted into the Clean Elections Clean Funding Program are required to participate, while traditional candidates are invited and encouraged to attend. The questions that we will ask this evening are coming directly from voters. Leading up to the, the debate, Clean Elections conducted voter outreach across the state soliciting questions for the candidates. Voters that are watching this debate live, you can submit questions at any time via email at debates at kc-a.com, or you can text them to area code 928-362-1062, or you can even call them in to area code 480-937-1297. Please specify if your question is for a specific candidate or for all the candidates. We screen questions for clarity to eliminate duplication or personal attacks on candidates. Uh, the debate is scheduled for about an hour, so we will not get to all audience questions, but we will do our best. Candidates, you have one minute for your opening and closing statements and one to two minutes for response for our voter questions. We encourage an open exchange of dialogue between the candidates. If you feel the need to respond to another candidate's comments, you may do so. I may limit responses for time management purposes and to remind when we remind the candidates that the audience and the audience that this is a respectful, courteous, and professional environment. Our goal tonight is to connect candidates and voters so the electorate may vote informed. Tonight's debate participants are Mr. Neil Carter, a Republican running for state representative in District 8, and Representative David Cook, a Republican running for re-election as a state representative in District 8. Senator Frank Pratt is also running in the primary for the House, uh, though he declined to attend tonight. Uh, the order in which candidates will speak has been determined by alphabetical order, by last name, starting with Mr. Carter. Uh, for opening comments, uh, you have about a minute. Mr. Carter, take it away. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for hosting this. Uh, my name is Neil Carter. As you indicated, I'm a Republican, and I'm running for state house in District 8. Uh, I purchased my house in Santan Heights in 2010, and I previous to that, I had lived in Gilbert. So I've been in the district for a number of years, and I'm not a politician. I, I am really in the private sector, uh, but I got involved with the party in 2016 because I contacted them to do some poll watching. Um, that was, as you recall, the Hillary Clinton election, and I assumed there'd be a lot of, uh, a lot of problems. So, um, you know, the party's kind of like church. They reel you in, you know. Um, and right now, TJ Shope is finished for term limits, so um, you could say that it's an open seat. Um, I've lived in the district long enough to see that we really need competent, professional, uh, conservative representation. I can remember several years ago, uh, we ran a candidate against the then Democrat, uh, Barbara McGuire, um, and that candidate had been involved in a bar fight and some other things. And we, wa we lost the election be because of that. So um, we really need to be sure that we're electing not just um, competent candidates, but also candidates who are conservative, particularly um, candidates that are Republicans who will oppose increasing taxes, for example, I'm not sure whether um, the viewers are aware, but there is a proposal before the state house this year to double the gasoline tax. Um, that's a proposal that was submitted by a Republican from Prescott. Um, so the mere fact that we have Republicans in office is uh, not a guarantee that conservative principles will uh, prevail. Um, of course, we're also at a 31-29 majority. So this is a very uh, important election year. And I would encourage um, the voters, of course, to, um, to take that into consideration. Mr. Cook. Well, thank you, Hank, and, and thank you to Clean Elections. I've known some of your board members, and I think you guys do a good job because anytime that you can get information out there about policy and, and about uh, how people's lives are affected, then make it available to people. They need to have the opportunity to do that. Uh, as the sitting representative in one of the two seats, 
Um, I'm going on my fourth year. Uh, I think everybody in the district knows me, but for those people that may be watching and stuff that don't live in District 8, uh, I'm a rancher. I'm, I'm going to turn 52 years old on May 15th. I've raised two wonderful children. Uh, my youngest daughter is at ASU. This is her freshman year. She's doing great. Um, we're ranchers, and, and we live out in rural Arizona, and rural Arizona is different than urban areas or down here in Maricopa County or large counties like Pima County. So what I did was uh, I've always been involved in leadership when it comes to cattlemen's organizations and developing policy and stuff as it affects businesses. And I've always served on the chamber boards and those things to bring together not only the cattle industry and agriculture industries, but to bring businesses together so we can better understand what their needs were, and they could understand what our needs were so we could have a, a successful economy in our small rural Arizona towns. Because uh, in rural Arizona, when you go to the grocery store, you pretty much know everybody in there or you know part of their family and stuff. So uh, I appreciate serving. I know we'll talk a little bit more about what we've done in the last four years down there to get the kind of the ship turned around. But we are being faced now with a crisis and what I believe an overstep of our Constitution and I hope we get to talk about that a little bit later. Well, uh, we are conducting this meeting for the first time uh, via Zoom. So uh, I think the way to start this off is talking about the coronavirus. Um, and I guess the, the issue of the day is uh, Governor Doug Ducey initially instituted an order for Arizonans to stay at home with exemptions for essential businesses. Do you agree with this initial order? And why or why not? And let's start with Mr. Carter. Uh, you know, it's a great question. I'm glad that you asked it. And I do want to thank you for hosting this as well. Um, you know, I, my educational background is, is in law. So I look at these from a legal perspective. And the first thing I look at is whether the state has the power to do these things legally. And we're one nation under law. Uh, we are supposed to have equal application of the laws everywhere. And when I look at this, it is a very dramatic use of state power. Um, now, if there's an imminent invasion, for example, the state may be within its, in, its rights to um, have a curfew or something like this, a pandemic maybe, but you know what? Uh, right now, what we're looking at is the state deciding to open some businesses before others. So effectively, the state is picking winners and losers in the economy and in the private market. Um, as far as it goes, if, if there were a, a grave uh, threat to danger, an imminent threat, that might be a use of state power that's, that's warranted. But the mere fact that they're opening some of the businesses betrays the fact that there is not an imminent threat. And so by that logic, they don't have the power to close businesses at all. At least that's my reading of the law. And Mr. Cook, do you think the governor went too far? With his initial order? Yeah, let's start with the initial order. Yeah, not at all. The governor did not go too far with his initial order because we did not know what was going to happen. And that's what the government's number one role is for public safety and education. We need to always remember that. And so one nation under God is what I would rather say. And we are operated by the rule of law, which is made by man. So when we think about the initial order, it was what we didn't know and the, what the information was coming in about how we were looking at the effects in other countries. And when we look at countries like Italy and we had the higher death toll rate that was going on, we need to protect our citizens, most importantly, our children. So when the governor uh, made his initial order, I agreed with it. We, I agreed with the plans that we came out with to make sure that the kids could still go on, online and learn at homes, those that didn't have computers, we found ways around that in rural areas, uh, and teachers got to keep teaching. But it, it is now we're at the point that we look back at the initial order, what steps were taken, and I think that really good things were done. We gave the governor at the immediate time, we believed it was necessary, the resources that he would need while we recessed. And so it sounded like you were coming to a butt, perhaps, there. My next question is about the extension of this order. Yeah, I don't want to get off target, but when we recessed, it's because when, when you represent the people, right, then you, we needed time to go out and investigate because we had been down there for months focusing on policy, working uh, 
to with a plan when all of a sudden this thing came up immediately we came up with the emergency plan governor issued his executive orders which i said i agreed with and i did and then we needed to get back out into our districts and talk to our constituents our business leaders our first responders and all that and so when when hospital beds and hospitals were uh basically told okay you can't do anything because what the data is telling us we're going to have this massive in wave uh, and the need for hospital beds that we're going to have to have temporary hospitals put up in parking lots and things like that it's a much larger plan than than i could probably talk with just answering that simple question so I want to ask you, though, do you agree with the extension of his order? Yesterday, the governor announced that he's extending his order with some slight modifications until May 15th. How do you feel about that? I do not agree with the governor's extension. And you, Mr. Carter? I, I'm very similar to, to Representative Cook. I do not agree with the extension. I, I do believe that six weeks ago, we didn't have the data that we have now. Um, we really need to... to have a rational government and re return reason to government, not fear. We can't be governing based on fear. We now have, of course, six weeks of statistics. And we even have, as it were, a kind of a control group in the country of Sweden, which didn't do a lockdown and has lower numbers than Spain and Italy. And I think looking at the numbers, um, we should go forward and, and, and get back to business really. And so the governor is, you know, trying to go forward. He announced uh, yesterday that he would be uh, kind of phasing in opening of retail shops. Uh, it sounds like both of you agree with that decision to start reopening the, the economy. Am I correct? Who do you want to go first, Hank? Well, uh, if if you've got if you've got something to say about it, go ahead. Well, well, I agree. But here here lies the problem, Hank and, and Neil. Uh, please pay attention. Um, is the fact that some big box companies have never closed. So, so why is it appropriate for the super Walmart over on Hunt Highway to be open and selling jewelry there, but the mom and pop shop in Casa Grande or in Globe United Jewelry and, and those places, they can't be open. And so when government starts to pick winners and losers at, at that level, so whether it's a Home Depot versus a local lumber yard, or if it's the dentist office versus the uh, physician's office, then there lies the problem of who are we saying is going to be successful and who are we saying is not going to be successful? This is exactly what the problem is. It's giving the government too much power really because it's exactly picking winners and losers. And, and that's why it's a problem. I, I, I concur. So uh, our state laws and constitution both allow the governor uh, very broad authorities when he declares an emergency. Should we revisit that? Uh, if, if you would permit me to answer first, just really quick. Yes. I think that, like I said, if there really is an emergency and the health or safety of the population is at stake, like I gave the example of uh, foreign invaders, could be a pandemic too. That's one thing. The, the problem, however, is that we're living in a in a in an era of sort of fear of liability and of lawsuits and things, and people following suit um, more out of a fear than out of true leadership. I, I think, and and you know, one of the other problems too is that the government itself has created a kind of perverse incentive for things like declaring an emergency. Why? Because then they have access to emergency funds and things like this. I remember uh, a couple of weeks ago we were watching. Uh, almost like watching dominoes fall, a series of cities all declaring emergencies, whether they had a case or a death or not. And they're doing that, of course, because they are trying to access those funds. So, you know, the bigger the government gets and the more that it expands, then the more we're going to start seeing government policies like this that start to adversely affect your life. Mr. Cook, let me let me tailor this one to you a little bit, because there are a, a number of your colleagues who are talking about sponsoring, uh, passing a concurrent resolution uh, as authorized under the law to basically end Ducey's emergency order. Will you sign on to that? Uh, Hank, you have a you have just said that some of my colleagues, would you like to tell me which ones? Uh, Mark Fincham, Kelly Townsend, Warren Peterson, for example. Okay. Uh, the, re the resolution has not been drafted yet. We, we have had meetings about that. Um, we are all on the same page of what we believe needs to be done. And um, I think that you're, you will have a little bit more information 
after this unfolds later on. But still, there are politics here. And what needs to happen is the meeting between the governor himself and the president of the Senate and the Speaker of the House needs to happen as soon as possible, as quickly as tomorrow morning, I would think. So is that a yes or a no? Will you sign on to that legislation? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so Mr. Carter, um, as somebody who doesn't work inside state government, I'm especially interested to hear how you think uh, the state government has responded to the coronavirus on a scale from one to 10, um, 10 being the best and one being the worst, where would you rate the state's response and what are the flaws? Well, I would say that my estimation of its response has, uh, has fallen o over the weeks as, as it drags on precisely because it seems to me that uh, the, the government's overstepped its bounds at this point in picking winners and losers. And how about the federal government? How would you rate their response? Again, I think that when the data first came out, what we saw was that this was a big threat. We saw that it had a higher mortality rate. We were worried about a situation that, like one that unfolded in Spain and in Italy. And I think that President Trump has done a great job in general and, and on this front as well. But remember, when you're in a position like um, the governor or President Trump, you, you have to rely on experts when it comes to, to, to situations like this. Because of course, nobody can be an expert in everything. And so we do have the Center for Disease Controls and the doctors that were looking into that. The best advice that he received at the time was, this is going to overwhelm our hospitals, so we need to do something dramatic about it. And we did, you know, do something pretty dramatic about it, and it turns out it didn't overwhelm our hospitals. Um, do you not see that as a success? I guess, it, you know, both of you have d expressed a certain amount of skepticism about the measures we've taken. Um, but it could very well be argued that we are in the fortunate, relatively, position that we're in now because we went through those hard uh, decisions. That's an argument that could be made, but like I say, you do have a sort of a control group, and you can look at some of the other places that haven't done lockdowns like Sweden, and you can see the numbers there and see if that isn't um, any different from places that have had more dramatic uh, implementation. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the budget. And this is still yeah, kind of a on that if you don't mind. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Cook. So, so Neil made a point there about the Sweden stuff. Did, did you read the article from the scientists from Israel? Hey, did you see that around and stuff? It was circulated about a month ago, maybe. It doesn't ring a bell. Yeah, if, I, if you haven't, I'll try to get it to you sometime if I remember. Uh, but what it is, is, is that the what what Neil just said is, is accurate. In, in this study that was done in Israel, it showed that the countries that did their lockdown and countries that did not do their lockdown, the basic curve was the same. And so you can say, well, we shouldn't have done it or what, that, that's not the point here. The point here now is the question was whether or not the states and the federal government had adequate responses. Yes, but they should not be long-term impacted responses that go unchecked by other branches of government, including the judicial. Okay. And like, I, I wanna move on to the budget a little bit, and this is still kind of a coronavirus related question. Um, the state budget analysts predict that Arizona will face a $1 billion deficit, that is a billion with a B, uh, because of the economic fallout from the COVID lockdown. Uh, first of all, uh, those numbers are very much in flux. Um, but how do you provo propose to solve this deficit? Meaning, would you cut government programs? And if so, which ones? Or would you raise taxes? And if so, which ones? Mr. Carter, let's start with you. Sure, okay. Um, well, I'll tell you what, I'm glad that you asked this question. The government, it is when government expands, freedom contracts. And, and the government is something of a necessary evil. There are definitely traditional government functions that need to be, need to be funded. Um, traditionally, we have public defense, security. In America, we have public education, for example, and some transit infrastructure and things like this. Um, you know, I really get angry when I watch debates and sometimes national presidential debates or whatever, and they talk about creating jobs because the government doesn't create jobs. 
Small businesses are actually one of the biggest job creators. The business in general creates jobs and the government more often than not gets in the way of that. So the, the, the idea here is raising taxes when people are already suffering from less income is the wrong, is the wrong thing to do because what it's gonna do is it's gonna even contract the economy even more. We're already looking at a situation where people don't have the extra spending money. You're gonna start taking more of it to spend on government projects instead of investing in their communities, expanding their businesses, getting back to work. It, it just doesn't make any sense to me. So how would you propose to solve the de deficit that we're facing? Well, I think that the first thing that you'd have to do is look across the board. Um, you know, I, I, I'll tell you what, I've, I've run businesses and I can tell you that you can say, you can always save money somewhere. I mean, I can save money right now, not buying this stapler or this burrito or something. You know? Where in state government would you propose saving money? Well, to, to begin with, what I would look at is I would tell the, the various departments, look, you need to come up with a specific percentage of cuts across the board right from the get-go. And we'd have to look at the percent, of course, depending on how much revenue we were losing from, from the pandemic. But. And are there any departments that you would exempt from that? I think that you can find savings in every department. And Representative Cook, your yeah. thoughts? Well, I, I got sidetracked there with, with some of that. Repeat the question for me, because I'm going to... Well, it, you know, we're facing a billion-dollar deficit right now. Um, the solution, generally speaking, is you've got to raise taxes or cut services. Uh, which, which one do you propose, and what specifically would you do? Okay, Hank, first of all, we're not raising taxes. We're not raising taxes. We don't, there's no need to raise taxes. And what are we cutting when when you say we are the, the are you speaking of JLBC when you say yes okay so when JLBC comes out which they haven't come out and said that to me I think that's the rumor on the street a little bit no because, they've held meetings oh hold on okay it came out in a meeting uh, this morning wasn't it. Uh, they talked about it several weeks ago. Uh, obviously, as I said at the beginning, these are far out revenue projections. We don't know right. what it'll be, but so, give or take a billion dollars. So, so, well, that's a lot of give and a lot of take, right? I mean, that's okay, LBC that's, says the way I operate is this. I want to see the facts. And the facts are this. Before we recessed and gave the governor the, re the funds and the resources that he needed. Let me just walk you through the numbers. It was a small percentage that was forecasted that by shutting down and doing the stay at home order, what exactly would the impacts of the state economy be? Those numbers were given to us around 400 to $450 million. Okay, that, that's, that's the hard number we were given because we wanted to know if this happens, what are the ending results? And so I, I think those guys do a great job down there. Now, keep in mind, a billion dollar shortfall, we were setting almost on a billion dollars in cash surpluses because of our roaring economy, which I support the governor 100% in his comments of Arizona is open for business. And we've all heard that numerous times, right? Arizona is open for business. Roaring economy. We're setting on a billion dollars in cash. So there's no alarm at this point to be talking about cutting services or raising taxes. We have to have cool thinking heads. We have to get the real numbers after they come in after in the month of June, June 1st, when we start seeing what the forecasts and revenues are. That's why you see people like me and those others that you've mentioned is it's time to get these businesses back open because I believe in that slogan, Arizona is open for business. And where we're getting hit the hardest is, which you all know, and, and Neil is on the TPT, right? We are a heavy TPT state. And that is where our revenues are, are basically, the majority of them are driven from. So if we're sitting on a billion dollar rainy day fund, and we're sitting on a billion dollars in cash, why would we even start talking about raising taxes or cutting services? That's we need to get the economy back to roaring where we can decide then of how much and where it should come from. But but the state of Arizona should feel very comfortable as long as we can turn the light switch back on 
for small businesses throughout the state. Okay. And um, I want to talk a little bit about our uh, our, our workers. Um, much gratitude has been expressed for workers that have continued to provide essential services to our community during the pandemic. Uh, workers like grocery store employees and janitorial workers. Uh, given the spotlight that has been placed on these kinds of do you feel the minimum wage needs to be increased? And secondarily, do you feel that the state should mandate that these types of workers uh, should receive hazard pay as they continue to work through the pandemic? Uh, let's start with Mr. Cook this time. Okay, thank you, Hank. So, so I heard a couple questions in there. One of the questions was, do I believe that minimum wage should be raised? Uh, not at this time, no, because the voters just went to the ballot and they determined what they believed was in the best thing for Arizona. Well, now after we've shut all these businesses down in the economy for this certain time, we need to see how these things are going to be rolled out because there were many companies, small to large, that were looking for people to hire. Jobs were available. So the free market drives those things. And so if, if we take the minimum wage off the shelf now because there's other things that we need to be paying more attention to, the other thing is about hazardous pay for uh, grocery store clerks or Circle K, Quick Trips, whatever those people have that. One thing that I noticed is that I'm going to leave that stuff to um, the health department, and I'm going to leave that to uh, OSHA, Occupational Safety Health and Administration offices, to determine now that this is maybe how something has passed, but now you see the shields in front of the, the grocery clerks uh cash register they've done new things like the motor vehicle office for people that do that we may never see those go away so what is being done today to protect them it, it may be enough those are things that those professionals in those fields are going to determine over time but we all have the same signs one thing i want to end with hank it's terrible when we have to teach people to wash their hands i was taught that as a small child right you come in from playing outside, mom's got something fixed to eat. What's the thing she says? Go wash your hands before you sit down. Now you're doing I mean, it more often these days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And so today, when I noticed that was one of the main things we're focusing on is telling and teaching people to wash their hands. And Mr. Carter, do you think that, you know, given the uh, increased focus that we've had on these kind of low skill, often, uh, you know, uh, low wage, minimum wage workers, that it's time to increase that pay for them? Well, I, I, I got to start by saying I certainly concur with the hand washing. And I remember when I was a little kid, my older brother went to um, somebody, a neighbor lady's house, and she offered to let him play the piano because he was taking lessons. And he said, I need to wash my hands first. And it so impressed the lady. <laughs> said you can come anytime and play the piano. <laughs> um, so look, the question is on minimum wage. And, um, you know, I, I have a friend who worked at Ernst & Young, and he told me, you know, it's funny because the minimum wage is really negative infinity. And what he meant is that you can take an unpaid internship and work for free. You can even pay to work. But there's really just this tiny bandwidth between about $0 and whatever it is, depending on the state, that, that is illegal to pay people. Um, unless you make them an independent contractor or something. And when you look at that, what it really is is a limit on your right to contract, which is a right that's in the United States Constitution, so the Fifth Amendment. And it seems to me that, again, we need to let the market perform its function and let the market tell us what, the, I mean, the labor market is a market. What you're doing is you're creating a sort of false price floor. And in the end, it winds up driving up prices across the board. So you're never going to get ahead because any time that you raise the minimum wage, it's going to raise the cost of everything that people are buying, including those who are purchasing things, making minimum wage. And it's, it just becomes this never ending, like a hamster wheel of, uh, of increasing inflation. So I, I don't think that we need to take advantage of a crisis to change state law. And, and like Representative Cook pointed out, uh, the voters had already weighed in on that uh, pretty recently too. Okay, I want to I wanna talk a little bit about, uh, a little bit more about workers. Um, what is your plan? I guess, do you have a plan? And if so, what is it to support potentially undocumented workers or families, agricultural workers, and others who don't have 
benefits, uh, work benefits, and health insurance. Start it off, Mr. Carter. Sure, sure. Sorry to, to make you pick one of us, but it just no, seems it's, like it's less confusing. The awkwardness of doing these online, it's all right. Um, you know, I, I went to, to college and I had a roommate at the time who was from Vietnam and he uh, had to wait to get his citizenship. And he works for Intel now. He's an electrical engineer. He's a great guy. He's married and he has two kids and we're still very good friends. <clears throat> and, you know, he had to wait because that's the law. Now, you might disagree with the law and that's your right as an American. But if you disagree with the law, you work to change it. It doesn't help immigrants to stay illegal. So if you think about that for a minute, if, if you're worried about the illegal immigrants, you, you, need to, you need to work to make their status normalize, not it just encourage a kind of flaunting of the law, which really is a problem these days. So for me, the real thing is, why is illegal immigration an issue where we can somehow ignore the law where the other things aren't? And Mr. Cook? What do you think about these uh, kind of undocumented workers? Should they have access to health care in America, um, especially considering what we're going through today? Well, I'm not sure which undocumented workers we're talking about. I don't, I don't, I don't know any, but I know about the problem. And I can say that, you know, immigration is a federal issue. They, they keep kicking the can down the road. And we are limited at state government of what our abilities are to and what we can and cannot do about immigration. And we saw that in some of the recent court rulings that were struck down and passed legislation that was passed way before I got there. But I will say this, that the agriculture, you brought agriculture industry up. I've been to the border all across the southern part of the state as a legislator to find out what the problems are for the businesses. And I want to talk about Yuma specifically. Yuma grows some of the best vegetables and lettuce and stuff that in, in our entire country and, and cantaloupes and melons, all kinds of stuff that they grow that is shipped all over this country and actually out of this country as well. So the population that is needed, if you've never been down there, Hank, I, I might try to get you an invite. The population that's needed to harvest those things is massive. And those workers come through a legal system that is derived from today a permit system that they come from the country of Mexico into the state of Arizona to do that hard work and good paying jobs. There, there's, there's great companies down there that, that handle all this stuff. And then they return home to their families, to their country, where they want to be with their paychecks in hand. And if you think about if the amount of people that we needed to harvest those agricultural products lived where they're grown, one dirty hot dog uh, Kleenex from Circle K that blows across a lettuce field could cause severe problems, right, with our food safety. So that's an example of a wagon wheel in which the workers come from Mexico into Arizona in a legal system. They do the work and they return back home. And, and it's a great, it's Arizona, uh, Mexico has a great partnership in dealing with stuff like that. We can also talk about the cattle business in which they ship their stockers from there up here to Arizona. Uh, they have one slaughter plant down there, which means, uh, and we have one here in Arizona, Sunland, which means they need, have a need for beef that we send those cull cows and stuff down to their slaughter plant, in which is much needed down there. Now, any other business that wants to do that, then they have the ability, and we want to say get government out of everything. That's what I stand for is freedom. Uh, let private businesses operate. Well, whoever they hire, whether they have a contract or a visa or permit or whatever, that company can provide them with health insurance or whatever. But I'll tell you one thing about not only this great state, but this country. If, you're, if you are in need of any medical care and it's an emergency, you can walk in that hospital and get taken care of. And that's a wonderful thing today. Okay, so sticking... Do you mind Sticking if I just up. add something really quick? Go ahead, Mr. Carter. Um, Feel free know, to jump in, both of you. Okay. Um, I, I, I agree. Representative Cooks made some great, some great points. Um, the reason I brought up my friend is because, you know, this is about fairness, really. And if, if people are doing it right, have to wait. It's unfair, I think, to let others in just willy-nilly. Um, I did want to point out, though, that, you know, our um, opponent who chose not to be here tonight, um, he did vote to give illegal aliens in-state tuition at um, state colleges in a Senate committee, it didn't make it to the whole floor. And 
And that's the kind of thing I wouldn't support because, you know, my brother lives in another state, one of them, and he has children who would pay a higher price at our state colleges than the illegal aliens under our opponent's plan. So, I mean, I, I, I think we really need to look at justice, equality, and fairness when we consider these things from all sides, not just for um, those that are working here uh, illegally, but, but for everybody. And it is true that the United States is a very generous country. We, we don't say it enough. You know, I've had the, the privilege of living abroad. I, I've studied abroad and I, I worked abroad for a few years. And I can tell you that the United States immigration system is the most generous in the world. I'm not making that up. I, I can substantiate that and you can look that up. It is harder to immigrate to Canada. I know because I have a work visa for Canada, believe it or not. I speak French and I go there every year and I had to have a visa just to give presentations. It's harder to immigrate to Canada, to England, to France, to almost anywhere. We are a very generous nation. And when there are earthquakes in places like Haiti, it's always America that tops the list of places that donate. So, you know, sometimes I, I just get a little bit passionate about that because, well, it, it seems like we're being unfair to ourselves. We, it's really a justice concern and a, and a fairness and equality concern, I think. So sticking on the, the topic of kind of jobs and workers, um, the U.S. Small Business Administration recently reported that they ran out of money to help small businesses continue operations during the pandemic. Uh, leaders are calling for Congress to give more money to that program. Um, but as a state legislator, what ideas do you have to help businesses that have been impacted by the pandemic continue to operate and pay their employees? What can the state do? And let's start with Mr. Carter. <laughs> sure. I feel like you always start with me, but that's all right. It's alphabetical. <laughs> I, <laughs> that's funny. Well, I can't change my name. Well, I guess I could, but <laughs> I won't. Um, so I'll tell you, again, I, I look at legitimate state functions. I don't think that the state is there to pick winners and losers in the market. Um, however, the state is an actor in the market, particularly because the state... Um, assesses taxes. Now, the one way that you can help individuals and businesses is to adjust the tax rates to the extent possible, um, certainly to, to, to keep them low, but if, if possible, where, anywhere you save money, you're going to be helping small business. And, and so what, I mean, should the state, um, should the state do more uh, to prop up our businesses that are struggling right now? I think and if so, how? I think, like I said, I'm going to go back to my point that, you know, the state doesn't really create jobs. Any job that the state creates is a job that it's paying for out of money from you and me that comes from the citizens. And, and the reality is, it's kind of like this. It's kind of like we have a big lake here and we're going to go take a bucket out of it and we're going to walk around the lake and then dump the water back in the lake on the other side and hold a press conference and say, look, we created a job. I mean, that, it, it's really kind of ludicrous when you look at it that way. I think that the best thing that the state can do to grow the economy is to invest in those traditional government functions, particularly infrastructure that businesses rely on. So for example, transit is a big one. Transit infrastructure helps businesses. There's no doubt about that. Education is another American traditional function and that helps businesses as well. And I wanna point out some specifics, by the way, since we're talking about that, because it's better to give specifics really than sort of general propositions. You know, here in Pinal County, we have a number of major employers that are moving in right now. So, so Nokia is moving in, Lucid is gonna be building in uh, Casa Grande, making trucks. Uh, there's a bunch of things, actually very exciting to be here at the time. This is, this is one of the largest, the fastest growing counties in the nation right now. And you know what you'll find, Lucid has partnered with the Central Arizona College to create a certificate program because they need about 2,000 employees. And of course, they need skilled employees. And so they're partnering with the Central Arizona College, which of course is a tax supported as a public, um, a, a state entity really. And that's the kind of thing that, that that's good to see. You see, it's, it, it's the government helping out business right there, helping the citizenry. Um, it's symbiotic because of course the jobs feed back into the economy. Um, and like I said, investing in education is one thing, but also in, in infrastructure itself. Um, I know that uh, Representative Cook here has been instrumental in working on some things like um, bridges in Gila County and so on. I'm sure he'll talk to you about that. But, um, you know, we need to get started on the North-South Corridor Freeway. Um, I live in Santan Valley. Um, we, frankly, I moved down here and it was a one-lane road from Queen Creek to my house. And we used to stop at Riggs and then go a mile and stop at Santan Boulevard and go a mile and stop at... 
empire. And, and you know, they've managed to expand Ellsworth to three lanes, but why is Hunt only two? And one lane after Copper Basin, you know, that's the kind of thing that we can work on. Um, now, our opponent chose not to be here tonight. He lives in Casa Grande, and, and he's been in office for 12 years. I mean, 12 years is a long time, and you can accomplish a lot in 12 years, I think. And look, I-10 is still two lanes from Casa, from where he lives, from Casa Grande to, to Chandler. It's two lanes. And the excuse that's been given is that it, it crosses tribal land, and, and that's true. But you know what? Politics has been defined as the art of the possible, and we can't just take no for an answer. That's the point. They're elected to represent you, to work for you. And when they're there 12 years and they can't add one lane to a highway, I think it's time to consider another choice. I mean, no politician is entitled to his seat. They are responsible to you, the people. And the fact that they don't show up to debates, to me, just belies the fact that they think that really they're just entitled to the seat. They don't need to be here. They don't need to be talking to you about what their plans are. So I think you really got to look at that. You know, that infrastructure would go a long way to improving the economy in the state. And Mr. Cook, um, what, what, what can out. the state do to help businesses? I would love to talk about infrastructure, but the original question, can you repeat that for me, please? What can the state do? We're kind of talking about small business administration um, and how it's run out of money. What's the state's role and what can it do to help our businesses that have struggled for the last month and change? Okay, so so the, those processing, and I think you also asked about the workers, didn't you? Well, I think I put it in the context of employees, you know, struggling, small businesses struggling. So, so two different things we've done there. Number one is that when the federal government came up and they said, okay, here's the stimulus package that they're going to give this money to businesses and stuff, that's the federal government. We never see that at the state legislature, federal dollars. Federal dollars do not flow through us. They flow through the governor. The governor takes those dollars and he administers them. That's why when we gave the, the $50 million, uh, additional dollars to the governor to have resources, that we determined that you can use this money – after the federal dollars have run out. So we tried to do everything in the pre-planning as a caucus to make sure that, okay, federal dollars are coming, small businesses, they had to develop the program, the applications, the approval, who would be covered, who would not be covered. And so we knew that, okay, if it runs out, we need a safety net. That's why there's many of us that do not want to sign a die now. Now, when we get those numbers in June, we need to get our work done for the next two weeks on some policy matters. And then the governor can call us back in in June once we get the, the right numbers together. We know exactly what we're facing and we can make those critical decisions. And those decisions will be made this year in this session. Now, on the employees, what we did was we, we took those employees that lost their jobs. We waived many of the rules. And we have tried to beef up the agency. Now, the, what I'm hearing as a state legislator, not from my district, but from the entire state, is that there could be a problem in those people that have lost their jobs getting their checks immediately. Okay? And I, I know people that say, hey, did you get your stimulus check from the federal government? No, I didn't get one. But I know people that, that would text me or call me and say, hey, I got my, my check. Well, if that can happen in that amount of time, then we need to make sure that the agency that is administering the unemployment checks because of the current situation we're in, we are trying to find out now through, through our caucus and members, we're working together to find out Mr. Governor, because he's the executive branch, that's under him, what can we do? Can we move other agency employees over to that? Is there anything we can do to help speed up the process of those people getting of what they have coming. So the question, the way you put it is that money's run out. Well, in fact, those dollars haven't reached the people yet. So to say the bank account is at zero, what are we going to do to put more money in there when the money that was put in there hasn't reached all of the businesses and the employees that have lost their jobs? Does that make sense? To some degree. Okay. Um, I also want to talk about that. Oh, um, I'm being reminded uh, that voters who are watching this debate live can submit questions at any time by emailing debates at ac-a.com or texting 928-362-1062 
or by calling them in at 480-937-1297. And we've got quite a few questions coming in from the audience, and I want to hit on these things. Yeah, um, we talk about tra uh, infrastructure, because that's where Neil, and, and I'm not saying anything bad about Neil, but you started out about what are we going to do about businesses and the money and the employees as they run out, and Neil went over to infrastructure within the district. We, we got a couple of questions more on business and uh, Johnson Utilities, but we will get back to infrastructure. I promise to circle back to do it. Um, but right now, let's talk about, uh, I have a question here from the audience. Okay. Can Rec Cook talk more about getting back, getting the economy back to roaring? This morning, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance released data from Arizona small businesses that, that showing they were dead last in PPP loans made, just 265 approved for 100,000 people. How does he plan to keep these small businesses afloat when they're running out of cash? This is from the audience. And the question one's for you. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, whoever sent you the question uh, hasn't contacted my office. I'd like to read the report. I haven't read the one that, you, that was just quoted, but the small businesses that are running out of cash uh, it's because their doors aren't open. Look at the poor guy up there in Holbrook that uh, they even got arrested because he was trying to stay in business and stay afloat when they went over there and arrested him and wanted to put him in jail. We, the quickest solution we can have to this economic crisis is get businesses back to operating and people back to working. And I hope we talk about health care and jobs too. But how? I mean, you're talking about, you know, bringing businesses back to working. What do we do to make sure that they get back to working? Is it just simply lifting the restrictions? Because, yeah. you know, a lot of small businesses have now been on hold for a month. No income, still plenty of expenses. I, I agree. And, and, and I just had a conversation about small businesses today. So these municipalities and these mayors and cities and town council that want to put these restrictions on businesses themselves, which we I didn't even know, they, they have the legal authority to do that, and hopefully we can come back and fix some of these problems, is that, okay, I'm a small business. I'm licensed to do business within whatever municipality it is. I purchase my business license from the city or town to do that business. I pay a fee. Well, if they're not going to allow me to run my business for two months within that municipality, then why am I paying a 12-month fee for something when I'm only allowed to use it 10 months out of the, out of the 12? But it's not just fees. It's rent. It's, you know, your hey, electric yeah. hookup. So, we, so one thing that we're looking at is that the executive orders that the governor has passed it protects people from eviction and things like that in this time. So what we have to be careful about, and this is where it takes people working together, is that having the governor and having our leadership, which will be meeting, I believe, in the morning, to understand how do we ramp up opening these things faster while providing those protections to small businesses that are in place now. So if we were to do something at the legislature that repealed the governor's uh, directive, then what would the offset of harm for small businesses be doing? And that's what we're researching currently. And Mr. Carter, I'd like to kind of direct the same question to you. Um, how do you plan to keep small businesses afloat when they're running out of cash? Well, the, the number one thing is that we've got to get people back to work. And the easiest way to get people back to work is to allow them to work. I mean, this is really unprecedented, you know. Small business owners and Americans in general are resilient and they will be able to survive and figure things out if we let them. We, we can't be having people arrested because they're going to work. It's kind of crazy. And Hank, I, I really think we need to talk about what the governor just did in lifting some of these uh, health care restrictions for the uh, selective surgeries. What, what has happened is, is that when we were facing all this stuff in the health care, in the hospitals and stuff, they were told, keep these beds vacant, right? Mm -hmm. We're all in agreement. Keep the beds vacant. We're going to have this pandemic. We're going to need all this stuff. We're going to have mobile hospitals. We're making all these plans, right? So no elective surgeries. Okay, let's think about that. So now Mrs. Jones, let's call her Mrs. Jones, was scheduled to have her knee replaced. 
She got all of her insurance approved. She's going to have her knee replaced. She's going to go down to the hospital. That elective surgery has now been pushed off. It has impacted the medical industry in this state over half a billion dollars. So when you talk about small businesses, you, when you think about the larger picture, how, I mean, are we going to look to government to bail out the medical industry in a half a billion dollars? No, we, we don't have the money in the coffers to do that. What was the result and the right thing to do? The governor did the right thing by saying, okay, elective surgeries back on the table. But the fear of it was, and does anybody know here that the fear was why those elective surgeries were stopped to begin with? Well, we thought we might need the hospital beds for people. But in reality, there was a fear that we wouldn't have the personal protective equipment on hand if we did have a high increase or flux of patients in the medical facilities. So that was to hold on to the current resources we had while the manufacturing companies could ramp up their production and we could make sure we have enough on hand in Arizona. So if you look at what the governor and some of these things have put out is that, okay, we're safe. We have enough PPE. Now we can go do these elective surgeries. So once these things happen, they have an impact, not just in the medical field, but all of the small businesses that go into supporting those types of things. And, and what Neil's talking about the infrastructure stuff is that, when we go do those larger jobs, it's the smaller support companies that support those larger jobs that we need to make sure get back to work. And I think hospitals are a good example. And Mr. Yeah. Carter, I wanna direct this one to you. Um, the government shut down elective surgeries for hospitals for more than a month now. Um, that is a government action that cost private businesses money. Is the government in this case responsible for you know, making up some of that cost to these businesses. And, you know, these, that is a, an example um, of a larger, uh, it, of a larger issue. Uh, you, the same kind of argument could be applied to just about any business in the state in the last month. That's a, that's a dangerous argument. I, I, I think uh, are you, you, suggesting that the businesses sue the government to recover damages or something? No, no, I, I'm not suggesting that. I'm saying, does the government have a role in, you know, they shut down the hospitals. Well, look, uh, should they an elephant help in the room. bail them out? Things are closed. <laughs> we, 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 this is like you're, you left the bathroom tap on and it's flooding your house and you get out a sponge to try and clean it up. It's like, well, turn off the tap first. So uh, we need to get people back to work. And I think that Representative Cook made a great point. He said, look, we don't even have the numbers about how, how much this has impacted the state and how much money we've lost yet. So let's get people back to work. And, and that's really kind of the elephant in the room. Okay. Um, another question from the audience. Uh, they want to know both candidates' views on the Johnson utility issues. And there are so many Johnson utility issues. I'm not sure which one in particular they're talking about, but uh, I'm sure voters in LD8 are pretty well versed on these things. Give me a rundown of what you think uh, is the right path forward for Johnson Utility. And let's start with Mr. Cook this time. Okay, thank you, Hank. So so with, the, with that type of question about Johnson Utilities, we, we all know the history. And then a couple years ago, uh, Supervisor Goodman, who, who represents that district, called me up uh, for a week, about two or three times during a week. And he said, man, we need some help. We need some help out here with Johnson Utilities. I've never been there, been through there, no people, but never been to utility place. So being myself, I invited the entire Energy and Natural Resources Committee to accompany me to Johnson Utilities and inspect it ourselves. Not one person showed up except myself and a staff member. So I asked the hard questions to try to identify what the problems were and then to understand it. It wasn't, it wasn't all good by any means. So now after what the Corporation Commission done, because the Corporation Commission is actually the one that oversees the utility companies, not the state legislature. So when the Corporation Commission came out and decided to put the interim manager at core over them, and to, to, to fix some of that stuff, I read their updates when they send them to me monthly, 
and a lot of those things are in the plans. Now there's like this section 11, uh, like one instance, there was a section 11 that's, that's located over there. And the citizens were upset because they weren't going to close that down. And Johnson Utilities applied for a, a permit to, to expand it. And so that sent people up in arms. So being cool, calm, and collected, I went to the Department of Environmental Quality, dug into it, spoke to the director. And what had come to find out is they had been audited by the Department of Environmental Quality. Their capacity had been, had been uh, in question of what if they had an influx during the winter months and the visitors. And so they were told to create more storage capacity at that unit and until the other new unit could be built. So in fact, the, the utility company was in fact doing what state government was telling them to do. They were within one or two feet of their board capacity, their float board capacity is the way I remember. And um, so that's what they were trying to do to because they wouldn't have a spill that way. Now, the system itself, which I don't know everything about it, but the system itself has so many lift stations in it that when it was built it was as by section, I think that the design is somewhat flawed, which was done by an engineering company, of when, when, for instance, there was one case when Salt River Project is the one that supplies the power out there, okay? So the power went down. Summer storm came through, blew a power pole down, power went out. Well, the system is built on having a backup generator that is supposed to start up and kick on to supply the power to the lift station for the pump that pumps the sewage. It's actually pumping the sewage uphill. Okay. So when I went and I, thought, and I looked into that situation, what had happened was power went out, generator kicks on for the pump, but then there was a malfunction in the generator in the radiator part of it that said that it was overheating. So anybody knows that if you got one of those lawn mowers or something that gets low on oil, it won't start it kicked the generator off. So the thing that I asked the company was, okay, how often are you testing the generator? Are you documenting that stuff? Is it up to parts and services? Those kind of things. It has its problems out there. And uh, I don't know any of those people personally, but one thing that I walked away from there that changed my life was the way that the employees of that company, when I heard their stories of walking into the grocery store with their wives and kids that had a Johnson utility shirt on, the, the, the guy just trying to make a living for his family, the way they were treated. And it, it just, I couldn't believe that people could be so mean and hateful to a man and his wife and their kids. When I heard stories like that, I actually asked them, do you got some kind of therapy or insurance stuff where you can help these people that are coming to work every day that are getting the crud beat out of them? Obviously, tensions are high surrounding issues of Johnson utilities yeah. down in well, We shouldn't Arizona. be taking it out on these families. Mr. Carter? Um, uh, yeah, I, I agree. We, we definitely shouldn't be taking anything out on families, but... So I've lived here over 10 years and I'm served by Johnson Utilities. And although I don't have the uh, elected perspective that Representative Cook has, I can tell you, I do know a lot about it. And for example, I've personally received water shutoff notices and it says amount due zero. So you're like, what? I mean, billing issues, you name it. They had problems with effluent overflowing into Queen Creek. They've got problems down by Oasis where uh, on Hunt Highway where the, the just smelled of sewage forever. They've got problems with water pressure. I mean, th th you name it, there's a problem. It it's almost unbelievable. And so, so well, so that, you know, when, when you're in business and you're a private company and you have problems, I, I guess that's your own problem. You know, you, you go out of business or something. The, the, the difference here is Johnson Utilities is a public utility which has a monopoly given to it by the state. So people like me can't, we can't have water service from another provider. We're stuck with the provider in our, they call it a CCNN, Certificate of Convenience and Necessity. 
in our catchment area, we're stuck with that. Um, you know, Johnson Utility has been around a long time. Uh, he used to include political notes in with the bills and stuff. I mean, the people, I think, finally got fed up with all the problems. Um, what I would say, though, is this. Uh, it, what, what Representative Cook said, of course, is true. It, he, Goodman called him, and, and, and he, he went down there. And the others didn't. That's interesting. So, you know, when you call, I, I also have experience with this. This was before Representative Cook was in office. We called um, our officials, and we were told that's not our problem. That's, that's the ACC's problem. Now, that, uh, strictly speaking, it's true that the Arizona Corporation Commission, the ACC, regulates the utility. That, that, that's true. But that's a sorry response to me because there's so much that you can do. I mean, even if you did nothing, but held a town hall and let people say what the problems are and maybe type them up and, and give them to the ACC, that even just that would be better than doing it's not our problem. So I dug into it and it turns out that, you know, we're running against a, a third part, uh, you know, he's chosen not to show up tonight, but, you know, he's received donations from Johnson's lawyer and from others associated with Johnson. Um, you know, it's kind of like where there's smoke, there's fire. I mean, the, the Arizona voters in the 90s, we, you know, we, we enacted term limits into the Constitution precisely for that reason, because the voters in their infinite wisdom know that when politicians stick around forever, they fall victim to cronyism. Um, even the best ones, you know, they, they become more influenced, I think, by lobbyists and their colleagues than they do by representing the people. And, you know, we're looking at a, somebody who is switching houses for the second time. So he's already switched houses once because of term limits, switching houses again um, to stay in office uh, indefinitely. And, you know, I, I think that's part of the problem right there, too. Hank, I got something to add if, whenever Neil's done. No, yeah, go, go, go ahead, Representative. That's fine. So, Neil, you said you're a customer of Johnson Utilities. And so you, I, I don't know if this is the way it worked out. But the time that I was the only one that went down there and met with these people, and I asked the hard questions, well, what is this? What is that? All that stuff. That's just the way I'm built. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things is I said, well, the question is, if someone has a problem, how do they report it? And the answer I was given was on our website. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. I pulled out my phone, went to the Johnson Utility website, found five ways to pay my bill, five ways. Could not figure out how to make a complaint. I said, okay, now you guys show me how to do that. You say, do it on your website. Well, they messed around, messed around. Every time you click on something was to pay your bill. So my suggestion, because remember, I'm not over them, right? But I, I've seen it all and I've looked at it. I talked to them and I would got a phone call. My wife and I, we were... Uh, in New Orleans for a meeting, weren't we? We were in New Orleans for a meeting and I was getting, getting into a cab and the phone rang and I didn't know the number and I answered it. I said, hello, where are you? And it was Mr. Johnson. And I said, how you doing, Mr. Johnson? He said, fine. He said, I want to thank you for giving us that idea. He said, I looked at it. It's true. Now, remember, there's people that manage that stuff, right? I mean, they're just not the person and I don't know him. I didn't, the new, I haven't even met him. So I said, well, I appreciate that. He said, you're right. I said, my suggestion is this. You need a live person that answers the phone at Johnson Utilities. My water's out. There's sewer back. Whatever the problem is, there should be numbered forms. There should be the person's name and address, what the problem is, and somebody in the remarks section and, or action taken is how we used to do it in the prison system, is what action was taken and how it was resolved. And if those are numbered and dated, then there would be a way to track those things and he would know or whoever the manager would know that's those problems were being solved. And so they, he said the website was going to be fixed that following Monday. Now this is way back uh, a couple of years ago before EBCOR was put in charge, but sometimes the simplest solutions. And then if I was a customer and I, and, and that's what it is, they're so frustrated because how do I call them? What do I do? What do I say? And to me, that was a pretty easy solution, but I'm not sure if EBCOR is doing that same thing today. Yeah, but see, the, pro the problem then is, is it up to the state to, to pass a law or something that, that utility companies have to have comment sections? I mean, what are you suggesting that we 
I agree. Development to do. So the problem is we've thought about a lot of these things. I've lived here for years and we have been frustrated. And, and, and frankly, they may have listened to you because, because of your position a little bit more. They don't listen here. And it's interesting that you mentioned that they had so many ways to pay on their website. You know, I pay my mortgage on. Yeah, I, I, it's true. What you're saying is totally true. I pay my mortgage online. I, I pay. I still pay some student loans. I pay everything online. The SRP, I pay it online. The one bill I used to drive down there on Hunt Highway, just south of uh, Bella Vista, I used to drive and do it in person, was because they charge you a buck to pay online. I couldn't believe it. It was the only thing they charge you to pay online, which is cheaper for them than processing the check anyway. But it also turns out, turns out that. Price charges is 50 cents to get well, They do now too, yeah. But that's not to pay your bill, mind you. It's to withdraw right. cash. The thing is, I, we went down there and the lady at the counter turned out to be t taking the money. So they had to fire her because she was stealing stuff. And frankly, Johnson Utilities is one word. It is the story of, of malfeasance, complete and utter malfeasance. Now, have, uh, have, like I said, have it's better with Edcor. It's been absolutely better, absolutely better. Oh yeah, the, the problems have almost magically disappeared. Is it, you know, they needed to update a lot of their uh, infrastructure, just, just that, they weren't spending money on that. Uh, lots of things going on. I, I think we're probably gonna run out of time. I could talk about Johnson Utilities for a long time. You know, I, I was involved, because I am a lawyer, I was involved in um, somebody's suit involving the closure of a standpipe, which they had closed in spite uh, because some other water company was using it. I, the, the whole thing, really, I, I, I don't want to get into to all of it, but the problem is that it's a, it's a monopoly because it's a utility, and the state, of course, has a system whereby you have a catchment area, and that's your service provider. So that's what the problem is. Johnson Utilities would have been out of business a decade ago if it, if it wasn't a state monopoly. We were all tied in and required to, to purchase our water from. So, Hank. Uh-huh. Transportation. Transportation. So let, let, let me pause for a moment here. Uh, Clean Election says we can do an hour and a half if we want. You guys game? Uh, just another five or ten minutes, whatever you guys want to do. Just whatever's fine. Okay. Then, um, all right, let me, let me hit on two more from the audience, then we'll get around to transportation uh, and closing comments. Keep it relatively quick. Okay. Um, this is a question specifically for Mr. Carter. What would your focus be if elected? I'm glad that someone asked that. I swear to you, I don't have any plants or anything. Um, you know, I, I think that one of the problems with our legislature is that we, um, you know, it's interesting. We, we meet every year, uh, but some legislators don't. Like Texas meets every other year. I'm not sure that it's necessary to meet every year. But I do think that, honestly, government expands and freedom contracts and they get into trouble up there in, in a sense. You know, last year they were voting on whether to make lemonade the state drink. And then they decided not to. And then they decided that they would. <laughs> you know, so I, th th I do feel that th the better question isn't so much what would I do, it's what would I not do. And I I'll tell you, I'm a no man. I would say no to a lot of things. I would say no to doubling the gas tax. I would say Yes, it sounds like you had a question you wanted to do. Oh, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but one of the questions I always like to ask candidates is what law would you repeal? That's, that's a good one. Where to start? Guy. Um, well, I'll tell you what. I, I remember years ago that um, this was under Jan Brewer. Actually, our opponent, who's not here, chose not to be here tonight, voted to um, for the Obamacare expansion of me Medicaid. And, you know, I was just reading that the Heritage Foundation says that that's going to cost over three billion dollars between 2018 and 2022. I mean, there's things like that, you know. Um, th th there's a lot of stuff that goes on down there that I think really shouldn't. I mean, I can give you other examples. Um, you know, you, you can look this stuff up. I encourage you to look this stuff up. Look up um, HB 2495 from 2016. Um, this was a bill that gave $45 million to a, to a racetrack in Avondale. And again, our opponent chose not to be here, voted for that. I mean, you talk about saving money and raising taxes, but you know, we could save $45 million right there. We could save money on the tuition for illegal aliens right there. We could, I mean, there's lots of places we could save money and things like that that we could repeal too. Um, I got another one coming in from the audience. Uh, the eviction provision, uh, this presumably they're talking about uh, Ducey's executive order barring for, uh, evictions for four months, um, ends when the emergency ends. Four months. 
uh, and stops owners and landlords from demanding impatement in full. What is your plan to aid homeowners and landlords for their losses? Let's start with Mr. Cook. Well, I, I really, I don't understand what, about the eviction notices. No one is saying that no one's going to have to pay the bill, right? And so the homeowners and landlords, they should have that revenue that comes back to them. Everyone's going to feel the pinch. The, the one thing that I think, well, if, if we think about the terms of being evicted today because you have lost your job and you can't make your rent. I remember being in a committee hearing two years ago and they were talking about uh, raising some taxes. And I read them the article that the majority of middle income, not low income, middle income families could not take a $500 hit to their, to their balance sheet in their home in a month. They're basically a set of tires that they had to, if they did that, it would put them in a little financial arrears, about 500 bucks. So if these people have lost their jobs, then there can be no evictions, but it doesn't mean that those bills won't have to be paid at some point. Now, one of the things that we haven't talked about, and, and Neil, if you might understand this as well, is that the, the question was, our property taxes are due, coming due, right? We're gonna pay our property taxes. You can either pay the first half or the second half or the whole thing or whatever when your property tax your county. So the question was, well, should we push those off? And, and my position was absolutely not because we're not going to have forgiveness for these tax bills. So if we push that thing off and everybody knows that this is the date that's coming for your property tax, then all we would be doing is those people that pay them in two payments, we would be pushing them off farther together later on. And so That's exactly what we did for renters, though. I mean, like you said, nobody's saying that the, those rents won't come due eventually. Yes. That, that's just, well, you make the best decision you can. And I made the decision of that I know that my property taxes are due. And everyone knows that if you're a property owner, that those taxes are due. And what I've always told my kids and everybody that I talk to is that it helps to save a little money sometimes. And that goes back to the rainy day fund. I really think that I wish that this would have never happened, but we needed about $1.2 billion in the rainy day fund. Even though we got to a billion dollars and everyone's done a great job, the economy's great and all that stuff, we were just a little bit short in my opinion. And people say, well, why do you say that as a Republican? And it's times like now that I believe that we needed to have on hand 10% basically of what the cash on hand of 10% of what the state's budget is annually. So if I look at it as my household and my income, right, of what our budget is, I would hope that we could have saved or would have saved enough money for when you need a new set of tires or the kids do need braces, that you have something in reserves. And I think the people that might be hurt the most are those that are the ones that have been living on revolving credit. I think Mr. that's- Mr. Carter? What, what do you, for full so, disclosure, I mean, I should say, you know, I am a, a landlord myself and, and thanks be to God, the tenants have been fine. Um, but, you know, one of uh, somebody I know from my church, uh, their lease was up on the 5th of, I think we just lost. Did we just lose uh, Representative Cook? We might have. I don't see him either. Well, Maybe he'll pop back in. I'll go on with the, with the question for the audience. But, um, you know, th this... Uh, people that I know from my church, their, their lease was up on the 5th of April and they were required to get out. And it, you remember th this eviction, this postponement for evictions, it was only for people affected by coronavirus. So you had to show that you had it, that you lost your job from it or something. And so, I mean, they, they, they had to get out and, and they couldn't, of course, find another place to stay because of the, the way that it is. Uh, people aren't showing houses and things. And they're currently living, uh, I think it's in Chandler, but anyway, they're currently living with the, their, their parent. It was a family, so they're living with a parent, and and that's um, that's that's kind of tragic. I mean, what we're talking about is an extraordinary use of state power, and it was, of course, an, an edict by the governor, not by the legislature, to um, forestall for for not foreclosures, uh, evictions, and that 
is the kind of action the governor can take, because as you know, evictions are an executive function. You know, your sheriff um, will evict you. It's not a, a judicial or a, uh, it's judicial if there's a court case, but, but it's an executive function, the eviction. So he was able to, to take that step. But I mean, ultimately, like Representative Cook said, we're gonna have to get back to normal. And I don't think that the, gov the governor has the power to modify contracts, private contracts between you and me or between me and my tenants. Um, I, I think that he can forestall evictions for a while, but ultimately it's gonna come down to landlords um, accepting less payment or uh, you know, modifying the, their contracts with the lease contracts or court cases. I mean, ultimately though, it's gonna return to normal. Hey there, Representative, we got you back. Can you hear me? You're on mute. He's on mute. Oh. There we go. Welcome back. Sorry about that. We had that caucus meeting earlier, and my daughter's got me all set up on her computer, so she had to get it fixed back up. Battery went down. Nice. Okay, I want to move on to infrastructure. Um, let me ask you, what is the single biggest infrastructure need of legislative district? Biggest infrastructure need what? In of legislative district eight of your districts. Wow. Okay. So, well, that's hard to say. You want to say in Pinal County? Uh, okay. Yeah. Take it. Take it how you how you choose. You got to remember, Pinal County is about um, ninety two percent of district eight. So it's the largest, it's third largest county in the state. So one of the things that we've been able to do is my freshman year, I ran a bill called the Meridian Road Bill. They told me I couldn't do it, couldn't do it, couldn't do it, did it anyway. And so that opened up for the, like the town of Queen Creek that was able to, because if you think about Maricopa County, it extends, it's farther south of the 24 down to the Pinal County line. So when you have the town of Queen Creek and in Santan Valley and those, those people over there, they can't get to the 24 because it's in Maricopa County. So we had to get Maricopa County supervisor on board, the city of Mesa on board, along with Pinal County and the town of Queen Creek, that that bill allowed them to go ahead and now they're going to do Single Butte, Prisman, and Meridian Road up to the 24. That deal is done. Now, we had a groundbreaking of one of them. Uh, Meridian, think, yeah. Yeah, last year, okay. so. Now what we've done is focus on the 24, which is supposed to be completed uh, by the end of 2022, not the entire thing. And then to, to, to keep, Neil mentioned this earlier about the North-South Corridor. They've been working on this project for 19 years, okay, before I got there. Now, the tier one study that has been completed, they had them throughout the county, the tier one study is almost complete, should be completed at some time at the end of this year. So myself and David Farnsworth and Kelly Townsend and I talked to Frank and TJ and all of them got together and I said, look, the ADOT says they do not have the money budgeted in their budget to complete or to start the tier two study. And what I'm afraid of is that the tier one study gets done. So it's a wide swap. They pick a path from all the way from Interstate 10 near Picacho or Eloy, and it would run all the way up to Apache Junction. So you wouldn't have to go all the way around by Casa Grande on Interstate 10 and come back on 60 if you were headed that way. So the tier two study, ADOT would said it would cost between three to $5 million. And Senator Farnsworth, I ran a bill in this session, which is currently in the Senate for that $5 million. So we don't stop that progress of that tier two study because not one stretch of highway will be done. That $5 million wouldn't even do the tier two study from I-10 to Highway 60, but we wanna see that focused on the, on the north end. So if you think about the map in your mind, you, have, you would have Highway 60 that comes around, right? Then it would loop down around to the 24, then the 24 comes back around to the 202. So that would, be, that would be an enormous for those people that are out there that live there on way they can ingress or egress. And, I, and Neil knows if you want to drive to Santan Valley at five o'clock in the afternoon, you know, Ironwood's backed up out on the road to where it's unsafe because of the, of the light situation there. You got a light right there at baseline. 
and then it's not a quarter of a mile to the to Highway 60, which has another light on it. So when all that gets backed up, it backs out on the Highway 60. The, the Interstate 10, which Neil talked about, is that we thought that bridge was gonna be about $50 million, and it's gonna be less than that. We modified that. That funding is, is I believe, gonna go ahead and go through. That bridge has to be widened to six lanes before they can widen the regular part of the highway. And then in Gila County, I go back to the Tonto Basin Bridge. You know, when, when that tragedy happened to those family and those kids and stuff like that, they have been promised by the government for over 20 years that help is coming. And it would, it would be coming if it wasn't for the epidemic that's hit right now. Mr. Carter? What are your really top glad, priorities? I'm really glad you asked because, because frankly, transit infrastructure is my top pri top priority, um, and it's one big reason. A lot of the people living in Santan Valley feel disenfranchised because there's so many projects that that need addressing and haven't been. Um, you know, Pinal County is one of the fastest growing counties in the country, and particularly Santan Valley, which of course is unincorporated. And we'll get the census figures soon, but they're saying it's over 100,000 people now, and that means that the districts changed, you know, 10 years ago, it was very much a rural district and it's the size of Connecticut, but the district has become a lot of people who live in the area that I live in who commute to Chandler, Gilbert, Tempe, or even into Phoenix. The guy across the street from me works for, uh, he works at the airport, works for Southwest Airlines. So people are commuting great distances here and transit is very much our problem. Um, ingress and egress, as David Cook um, eloquently put it. So. You know, there are, I'm proud to say, a number of things that they are working on. Arizona 24 is paved to Ellsworth, so it's the county line and then stops. That needs to be expanded, and yes, it will be with the three exits that he indicated. The north-south corridor is interesting because it's entirely Pinal County freeway. And I want to I wanna talk about that for a minute, too. Uh, you know, that freeway is being paid for by the taxpayers and it should go where the taxpayers want it and need it. And frankly, they need it here. Um, when they were looking at the tier one study and about where to put the alignment of it, they were considering an alignment six miles to the east, which would put it very well, at least 12, at least 12 minutes further. So that would add to your commute by maybe a quarter or something. Um, you know, and one of the reasons I think that they wanted to move it was because there's state trust land out there, which for one is probably cheaper to obtain because they wouldn't have to eminent domain it, but also because the state trust land would be worth more when you resell it, I think, if there was a freeway close by. So, um, you know, I always look at who stands to benefit and gain from these things when they make these changes, and I just can't see that that change was just an innocent change. So w one of the reasons the people in Santan Valley are feeling disenfranchised, uh, besides the fact that, you know, there's been several struggles over incorporation and things is precisely because we feel ignored about Johnson Utilities. We feel ignored about the alignment of the of the freeway. They just feel ignored about a lot of things. And I think that it's interesting that we've never had a representative from Santan Valley in the history of the state um, at the legislature. So we re it really is time, I think, for, for, for competent conservative, you know, representation from the area. But in terms of transit, I went to, they, of course, they had a uh, community meeting on the North-South Corridor, and I went to it, and I didn't see anybody else there. It was just me. I didn't see our opponent. Now, um, uh, to be fair, Representative Cook, I believe, attended the one they had in Florence. They had another one in Florence. Well, well to be correct, I attended every single one of them except when I had to go down to the PBS news station. Good, good, good. Okay. Well, can I walk? Right. So to be fair, you, you were at them. I was at the, the Santan one. Um, I didn't see uh, Senator Pratt at, at one. I don't, I don't know if they went to one. I also went to the one they had on I-10. in uh, oh, Not on I-10. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. On I-11 um, in Casa Grande. Again, I didn't, I didn't see him there. So I, I, don't, I don't know what, what their feelings is on that. But I absolutely think that transit is important. And I think it is one of those traditional government functions, which as a conservative, we can get behind spending on. And I do think that it will increase jobs. And the funny thing is, you know, even if it's an all Pinal freeway, it's going to alleviate traffic on I-10 because it would be a bypass from Eloy to the Gold Canyon area. So anybody going from Tucson to Scottsdale could make use of it. Um, it it's absolutely essential. It's time to do it. And, and that's, I mean, there's no other way to put it. Really. So let me, let me clear something up, Neil, if it's okay. So what, what for Hank and for the viewers or whoever's watching this, 
So what Neil is saying is about them moving the, the, the highway to the east. On, on the, There's three different routes they may take there, and they're making those decisions now. One of them was to lay it on top of Ironwood Road. Yeah, now, that's another bad idea. <laughs> and it's the same way on the south part of that is that they were going to lay it onto the existing state highway. Mm -hmm. Now, just being a logical thinker, okay, so what are we gaining on north south Nothing. station anything if we're putting it over the existed brand new nice you know four lane divided road if we put the 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 north south corridor on top of that we've gained nothing if we put it over to the east at some distance probably where the little dog leg is there at apache junction that's the one i like is the fact that now we're gaining, we're adding additional lanes to north-south. And that's the same thing we face down there off Interstate 10 near Picacho Peak and Eloy. And those farmers have a, as a legitimate complaint is that they move a lot of their farm equipment down that you know, two-lane highway. Well, if you take and put this freeway in there, they're like, well, how do we get our farm equipment in? So that's all the stuff they're going through now. And, and uh, I appreciate you bringing that up. I think another problem that hasn't been addressed, though, is widening Hunt Highway. It, it's been widened as far as they can go. There's a tribal issue because after Copper Basin, it crosses their land. And, and they wanted to charge for a lease back to 1912. Um, I think it was 90 plus million or something that they wanted to, to expand it. Um, of course, the state said no. I, I think we need to talk with them. We, they, you know, that's what politics is about. We need to look at them, look at what their concerns are, and expand it. Because I'll tell you right now, Arizona Farms and Hunt is a disaster. It's a stop sign. Uh, a one way, uh, one out of three way stop sign, and there's going to be accidents. There's absolutely going to be fatalities, and it's it's going to take. Unfortunately, I, I think it might might take a fatality to get it to get it wide. And you know, the, they don't want to put a signal in there because what's the point in putting in a signal if you're going to change change the alignment later or something? So, meanwhile, it gets busier and busier and busier, and there's a courthouse there now, and that's going to be a real big problem. And that's, you know, and, and this is the problem for me too. I, I look at the ADOT plans that they go five years out or 10 years out and you can look at them in the future and you can see whether something is in the planning stage at all. And if it is, that's great. If it's, if we're not even talking about it, then we absolutely need to be talking about it because we know that these things aren't going to be done in a year or two. They're going to take several more years. And another thing I think, uh, if you don't mind, Neil, is that the taxpayers of Pinal County, they voted to tax themselves. Yes, Before that's important. Infrastructure. So mm -hmm. when people start talking about, oh, we need to raise gas taxes, gas taxes, the people of Pinal County have already voted to tax themselves for infrastructure. And, and as soon as that lawsuit and stuff gets settled up, then there's going to be money available there for that north-south corridor project and some other things. Right. And that's why I think that the people of Pinal should be deciding because they're the ones footing the bill through their own tax, exactly like you said. This is not just a general state project and the whole state maybe has some input. I believe that you know, you pay the piper, you call the tune, the people in Pinal are paying for that. They should be the ones who say, look, this is the alignment we want, not maybe something that benefits the state or someone else. Absolutely. Hey, good back and forth, guys. Okay, one last question from the audience, and then we'll move on to closing statements. You guys okay with that? Sure. What does moral character mean to you? Let's go alphabetically. Mr. Card. So uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I think, I believe, it, well, for one thing, I need to say that I'm, I'm a Christian person. I, I, I have to tell you, I believe in God, and I believe that there's something, there's a higher power, there's something beyond ourselves. And, and that, of course, informs my worldview, because what it means is that we are not the end all and be all that, you know, we're accountable for our actions. So I think that virtue and, and, and morals has to do with being accountable for your actions, doing what's right. Um, and if you wanted to ask me what what is right? Well, I think that I, I believe in the golden rule, because it's, it's usually generally applicable. I mean, if, if if you wouldn't mind someone doing it to you, then maybe it's okay. But if you would mind someone doing it to you, then don't do it to others because because that's probably not the right thing to do I, I guess in short i mean i could go on and on on, on on this topic but but that's that's what i would say in short mr cook yeah i think it's going to be different with anybody and everybody i mean uh, we're all created differently god's made each one of us uh, their own and uh he gives us our freedom of choice and I, I definitely don't want someone in government especially some of those people down there that i work with now I'm making a decision of what more morals means for me. So for instance, I absolutely 100% oppose abortion. 
but I know that many of my colleagues down there that I work with, they support it. So who am I? And when I, and since uh, being a Catholic, one thing I'll say is that we're not put here as judges, we're put here as witnesses. And when we go to judge others, then I think that we're off the beaten track, especially when it comes to the, the political arena. Because I can say that um, we can bring up things like gay marriage, we can bring up abortion, we can bring up those hotted topics. And although me and my colleagues may not agree on those hard subjects, when it comes to policy that betters the lives of the people, then I think that's where we find that common ground to move the state forward. And I think that's what our system is set up for. I, I, I would add to that, it's true that we shouldn't judge others, but we still need to have standards. So it doesn't mean we can just dispense with standards. And, and I, I do think that it takes a certain amount of moral courage and leadership. And, and there, we are entering a weird moment of the emperor's new clothes where, you know, it's unfair to girls in high school to let boys compete as a girl. I, I'm sorry, some, somebody needs to stand up and, and just say that, you know, we're not judging anybody, but we still need to have standards. And I absolutely concur with um, Representative Cook about abortion. In fact, I wrote an article in the Arizona Capital Times on that subject if you want to read it, but um, that's just, that's how I feel. All right, let's move on to closing comments. Um, you know, this is your last chance to make your pitch to the voters here. What didn't we talk about that we should have? Feels like a good way to open that. What did we not talk about? We really didn't. Well, well, go ahead. I, well, I, I guess, what do you want voters to know that we didn't cover today? Is this our closing statement? I, I guess this is our closing <laughs> statement. <Yeah>. I got it <laughs> for sure, Neil. Um, I, I would say uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank you for hosting this. I want to thank uh, Representative Cook. Um, I would tell the voters primarily I am, am available for you. Um, I, I'll give you, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll give you my email. Uh, it's Neil K. Carter at Hotmail. I know it's Hotmail, but hey. Um, Neil K. Carter, it's N-E-A-L-K-C-A-R-T-E-R. -E -E so if you do have questions and want to follow up with me, please do. Um, I think that elected officials work for you and that I think that we need to take that into consideration. Um, I could go on and on. We've already gone a little bit over. Um, I would just encourage you to contact me um, to consider um, all the candidates and consider a change if a change is warranted. Um, and, you know, what I'm trying to do here is have conservative leadership at the state and retain the state's conservative character, really. So um, uh, with that, I think I'll, I'll leave it to you, Representative. Hey, thank you. Thank, thank you. And I, I would say that uh, I like my voting record, and I think that the people have sent me back as a top vote getter in each election for a specific purpose. You know, when you win your first election, it's always a test. And when you win your second election, then that's the truth. And what I've done is I've brought back millions, not one million, not two million. I've brought back millions of taxpayer dollars back to my district. I brought back the, the money for the water infrastructure over the DCP. And those are hard, hard fights. And I can tell you that, and I read something uh, about Mr. Carter when uh, he brought up something earlier is on one of his pamphlets, he said he wants to fight for the voter. Well, it's a different kind. It's not a physical fight down there, but you have to have strong courage and leadership to go up against uh, what may not be so popular. And you're not going to make all friends, but you are going to make some good friends down there. And when you look at sticking up for the people in your district first, it doesn't go that well sometimes across the entire state. But those things will all work out in the end. And so the voters in District 8, their lives, I want to make sure, are better. They should be better. Their educational system is better. I speak to the superintendents in the districts. I talk to the mayors in the cities and towns. I talk to the business leaders. And all of them, you know, we have a 100% return rate in anyone that contacts our office. And I'm going to keep doing that. And I'm going to keep working and fighting for the people in District 8 in both Gila and Pinal County. Because a lot of times the Copper Corridor in Pinal County has gotten forgotten, but since I've got there, we fixed their roads and we're going to continue. Every small town in this state of Arizona over a bill that I ran was paid back of what they had taken from them over 10 years of their Herkin Road money. 
So if you guys get out of the house and you go to Superior, you go to Globe, or you go to Miami, you go to these small towns, and you see a lot of these new street projects, that's because it's the resources from the taxes that have been paid and used somewhere else. We got that money back that had been taken in one lump sum over the past 10 years. And I got to thank my colleagues for helping me do that. And I got to thank the governor and his staff because they're the ones in the end that have to sign on to those bills that I've run and done. I appreciate you guys and Neil, I appreciate you being here tonight. I appreciate your interest. So give me a call anytime if you think uh, I can answer any questions for you. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Um, this concludes our debates. To the candidates, we thank you so much for participating. To the voters, we thank all of you who took the time to watch the debate and inform yourselves before the August 4th primary election. The Citizens Clean Elections Commission is your source for nonpartisan voter information. We encourage you to visit azcleanelections.gov for all your voting me needs. Thank you, gentlemen. This has been thank fun. You. Thank you. Thank you. My first virtual debate. Mine too. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Goodbye.